So, as I said, week four, we're covering advocacy in the digital age. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to be doing a breakout activity later. So um, to be ready for that, um, I'd like you to log into your uh, Twitter account. If you want to do that now, best that you do it on your desktop or laptop and just leave it open until our activity and then you'll be ready to participate. So if you don't have a Twitter account, you can try and sign up now over the next few minutes. Um, or if you want to just follow along as best as you can, but I would encourage you to sign up after this webinar is finished to complete the activity. So I just um, want to make a note here that I'm, I, I can't see the chat box. So if someone can uh, flag me when uh, there's something to, uh, to stop for, uh, that would be great. Uh, there's a lot happening on my screen. So I just want to make sure that if someone has a question um, that um, they're taken care of. Awesome. So this is the fourth installment of the five part webinar advocacy bootcamp series that Results Canada and OCIC are collaborating on. So welcome. Uh, we're in the home stretch. If you've been with us since the start, that's amazing. And welcome back. And if you're new to this webinar series, thank you for attending. We're happy you've joined us. And if you haven't already registered for the last and final webinar in this series, please do so. It takes place uh, next Thursday, May 28th. So to get started, we'll introduce ourselves. My name is Lisa Zentner. I'm the tall head you see here in the first photo on the left. And I work in communications and public engagement with Results Canada. Results is based in Ottawa, which is on the unceded Algonquin Anishinaabek traditional territory. Results Canada is an organization of everyday people empowered to end extreme poverty. We believe that no one should suffer or die from preventable diseases or lack opportunities because of where they were born. That's why we work every day to generate the political will for resources and improve policies so people living in poverty have what they need to thrive. Along with OCIC, we're very excited to be bringing you this workshop series. And now I'll pass it over to Ohenya, who is the arrow uh, pointing over in the second photo to say hello. I love this. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, so as you heard, my name is Ohenya. I work with OCIC, the Ontario Council for International Cooperation. For those of you that are uh, new to OCIC or, or haven't heard of us before, we're a network of over 100 organizations, institutions, and people that work in sustainable development and results is one of our amazing uh, members and partners. Um, so this is quite exciting for us when we can bring uh, forward the, the amazing work that happens uh, in the sector. And in this case, uh, it's their amazing advocacy expertise that we're tapping into and that we're sharing with um, our community at large. Some of my, my colleagues are also on the call, Eliza, I saw Marilyn in, um, so if you're interested about membership for OCIC, please reach out to us um, uh, on the chat uh, or over email. We'd love to talk to you about that. Pass it back to you, Lisa. Great. Thank you. So just some housekeeping uh, notes. This webinar will be recorded and sent to all registrants. Just be sure to check your junk folder from time to time. Sometimes the emails will end up there. Keep yourself muted unless you're speaking. We will have question and answer periods, but you can um, always use the raise your hand icon or use the chat box. And please do turn your video on because it is always nice and encouraging to see your face. So if you can, that would be lovely. Our goal today is to leave you with an understanding of the fast pace of digital within the media and political landscape and how to do advocacy within that space. We'll explain how the newsroom is changing and give you an inside view of how MPs are getting news from their constituents. As well, we'll provide you tangible tips and insight to feel confident using 
and advocating on social media and most especially on Twitter. Today's agenda is going to outline what we all know to be true as we live real time with COVID-19 and physical distancing, which is that our world is more connected than ever and more online than ever, and that there is a digital transformation taking place. So we'll look at that transformation through the lens of advocacy, the role of digital in the changing media landscape, We'll hear from Danny Glenwright, who is our first guest speaker, who will speak to us about media engagement. We'll explain social media, look at some tips and tricks, and how to use digital to amplify actions. And then we'll hear from our second guest speaker, Lindsay Sheridan, who will speak to us on political engagement. And then we'll do our breakout activity. So let's get to know each other better. So we will go into breakout groups now and our icebreaker question to discuss is, have you ever used social media for advocacy? If not, why? And if yes, what successes have you had? And please make sure to say hello, introduce yourselves and then answer the question. So I'll pass it to Ohenia to uh, put us into groups now. Um, I want to start us off today by um, talking about the power of social media as a digital advocacy tool and how it enables local and global advocacy. So online social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and others allow you to connect with someone in your town or across the world on an issue. You can reach a large, diverse audience uh, instantaneously learn from others, so what advocacy efforts are, are working in other regions or other countries. And especially during these trying times, it can be easy to turn inward, but now there is an opportunity to support one another and show global solidarity. So if we just look at the stats, uh, it's pretty clear uh, why digital is such a powerful tool to harness for advocacy, particularly in Canada. You can see here of the entire population, which was 37 million in January, as of January 2020, 96% of Canadians had a mobile phone, 94% used the internet, 67% were active social media users. So if we compare these numbers with global, you'll see the differences in the penetration rates of mobile and social, yet these numbers really will only increase. In fact, mobile phones have had an overwhelmingly positive impact in the developing world allowing people living in remote and low income countries to get access to things like banking, education and opportunities to participate in their country's governance with things like long distance polling and voter registration. We see this power of digital reflected in online movements where platforms like social media and networking apps like WhatsApp have in some cases been started by one individual sending a message or creating a hashtag that results in massive, oftentimes global movements. They've supported and empowered those who have felt powerless by giving a voice and a platform to speak for those who have been silent. So as we are connected online now more than ever, we can harness these platforms and networks for the benefit of all. In addition to using these platforms for global movements, both individuals and organizations can use them more locally for advocacy. So I just wanted to show you some examples. So here on the left at the top is an example from a volunteer that used Twitter to send a message to her MP, Karen McCrimmon. And the message got through loud and clear with Karen saying that the then Minister of International Development, Marianne Monsef, would be passed along her message. Our public engagement coordinator, Melissa, who's on the call today, tells the story about how when she had her first ever sit down meeting with her then MP, Stephen McKinnon, and I remember she was particularly nervous about this first ever meeting. Um, when meeting her, he recognized her name right away and said, oh, you're my Twitter friend. So that means he was paying attention to her tweets and it started off their first meeting very comfortably as there was already a connection and her MP already knew the issues that were important to her. Uh, on the right is an example of uh, an organization's digital campaign that was just launched by CanWatch and CCIC, advocating for global solidarity by asking individuals to share their tweets. 
So amongst other channels, they're using LinkedIn and Twitter as part of the campaign to reach the federal political ecosystem. And um, the, the results are good. So now that we have an understanding um, of the power of digital, let's take a deeper dive into using online for media engagement with journalists and political engagement with parliamentarians. So I'd like to start off uh, first by talking about digital media engagement. So we know that the traditional media landscape is changing as our world increasingly shifts online. And this has an impact on the ways in which we take action. So if you're not new to advocacy, you know that writing a letter to the editor or an op-ed and getting that published in a local or national paper is very powerful. So it's interesting to take into consideration as the world moves online and more and more journalists develop a strong digital following, how we remain agile and relevant with our advocacy. So the question is, how do traditional media and digital media intersect? Well, to help us answer that question and explore more about digital media engagement, I'm very thrilled to introduce to you our first guest speaker, Danny Glenwright. Danny is the Executive Director of Action Against Hunger Canada, an international humanitarian and development organization specialized in fighting hunger and its underlying causes. He's also the managing editor of The Philanthropist, an online journal for practitioners, academics, supporters, and others engaged in the nonprofit sector in Canada. He's a journalist by training and has more than 15 years of experience in the nonprofit and media sectors in Canada and internationally, including several roles as managing editor. So, Danny, welcome. And I'll ask Chris Dendies, the executive director of Results Canada, to moderate. So, thanks to you both. Chris, over to you, and I'm going to stop my screen share so that we can see you. So thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Danny, for being here. I have to find you now in your little... No, I, I'm looking for you, too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, well, that's great. It just means there's a lot of people that are turned on and listening to this. So, Danny, let's dig right in. Um, yep. so I just... The one constant right now feels like change. Change is the constant. In, and just even and that's particularly true of media landscapes as well so what's the most important thing to know about the changing media landscape in your viewpoint your perspective i think chris the most important thing to know is that despite the constant talk of change and there has been a lot of change as well the fundamentals of media engagement haven't really changed uh, i just re finished reading a book uh, by alan rusbridger who edited the guardian for 20 years and many of you may know the guardian guardian it's it's a former it's a paper that started in the uk as a print product and is now the leading digital news outlet in the world and alan throughout the entire history of his time 20 years at the guardian has this sword hanging over his head you know worried about the future of this paper that we now know as one of the top media outlets so change is constant um, I, I think for the purposes of this call, the, the fundamentals of advocacy and what, you, what we want in our media and what media wants are the same. The first one is, and this goes for jour aspiring journalists or if you're looking to get advocacy in the media, you need to know your audience. Uh, I used to edit an LGBT publication in Toronto called Extra Newspaper, and I did that for three years. And I can't tell you how many times we got pitches from wannabe writers or publicists that had absolutely nothing to do with the content that our paper published. And it, all I did was delete that, right? So it, it's insulting to the publication if you haven't taken the time to read it and see what they would want from you in terms of what, what, it, what your work is. The second most important thing is, you know, tell a story. Uh, stories are fundamental to our work. A good story is all you need to suck somebody in. And any good journalist knows it's just all you need is one story. I w I'll tell you a story. I was recently in Guatemala with Sally Armstrong, the very famous Canadian journalist. She's interested yeah. in women's rights issues. And I had convinced her to come with me. Sally's a friend of mine. I convinced her to come with me because I said, um, parents are giving away their kids to try to get into the United States because of hunger in Guatemala. And they're going on these dangerous convoys into the US. And she said, I need a, a kid who has gone and been sent back. Mm -hmm. And Sally's a, a, you know, a professional. We spent two days in Guatemala and she was on edge the whole time, you know, I, and, and worried. And, and until we got that child 
who actually exemplified that story, it was funny to see just how, you know, everything was fine then, you know, once she had that story. So there's nothing like a story. There's nothing like a character about it. And that also illustrates my next point, which is you need to talk to the people that are affected by the story. It doesn't help to talk to the executive director of an organization championing X cause if they haven't experienced it. You know, Paul Taylor, who runs Foodshare now, is an excellent example. He, Paul Taylor is a, an executive director, but he also has a history of experiencing food insecurity. So that's great. You, you know, it's a good example. But often you need to go to the grassroots and speak to the people who access that organization and its work. That, that's the story there. And that's what the media wants. And, you know, Chris, we've talked about the lack of diversity in the media. Well, it's our job too, as advocates, to find those diverse voices and, and give them to the media. Because the other constant that hasn't changed is that uh, media is cash strapped. They don't have money. They, you know, they don't have money to send journalists into the remote regions of Canada, never mind internationally, to get the stories. So the more you can package for the media, uh, no matter how much it's changing, the better. Uh, we, and you know, I, we know that print media seems to have been on its deathbed for a long time, but it's still there. Uh, so op-eds are still important. And um, I'll tell you one last story and then, and then I'll you know, let, uh, let, let you ask me more questions. But uh, we went to, to Bangladesh after the Rohingya crisis a couple of years ago to, to tell the story of all the, the refugees coming from Myanmar. And I'm uh, friends with the, the owner of the Toronto Star. And I, just, I, I had been tweeting about the, my experiences there and he wrote me and said, Danny, write about this. I, we can't afford to send anybody here. This is a major international issue. And I, you know, I be, I'm a journalist by training, so it was a bit easier for me. But I was in, an exp, in a situation that no Canadian media could afford to send a journalist to. I wrote the story, it was on the front page of the Toronto Star. So you know, if you're in the right place at the right time and have the most compelling story, anything's possible. Danny, I, you know, storytelling is like the the lifeblood of advocacy i totally get what you're talking about you can have all of the stats in the world and one you know one one good honest and truthful story from a personal perspective is 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 powerful um how how just in the interest of this kind of webinar how can how do you have any advice on how people on this call could use digital media for advocacy and to amplify the message to give our advocacy wings to harness it Yep. I think the first thing to remember is do your research. You know, figure out who you're trying to influence and then see how they use social media. I've already seen in the chat function, I haven't been following super closely, but people saying, what, what is social media? How do you define it? Why just Twitter? Well, it's actually not just Twitter. Uh, the MP in my writing is very active in the Facebook groups of all the different communities in my writing here in Toronto. And so we have neighborhood groups here where people go and complain about, you know, whether their dog's gone to the bathroom in the wrong place or whether the raccoons are getting into a bin or whatever it is. But our MP is responding all the time in that group. And there's hundreds of her voters in that group, which is why she's, she's responding. So if I wanted to reach my MP here in uh, Davenport in Toronto, that's the first stop I'd go. And I know that because I see her there. Uh, other MPs, as you've noted, you know, are, are on Twitter all the time. Uh, and that's how they use it. So tweeting at them is really important. So I think you just need to know what person you're trying to influence and how they use social media. And, you know, sometimes you can go, you know, get to them through their constituents as well. The other thing is, you know, ride on the coattails of success, successful initiatives. You know, we'll probably never, none of us will ever create a Me Too um, I hope there's no need to, but you know, we, yeah. it, it, we won't see that type of success, but we can certainly use the hashtags that come out of those type of uh, initiatives for our own purposes. Uh, I was recently tweeting at a friend of mine who's trying to promote her book in these COVID-19 times. And she said, you know, I, it's so hard to get all this signing done with, and, and get the book sent out. And I remembered Margaret Atwood had created this signing machine to sign books internationally because she was tired of doing all these book tours as well. So I mentioned this in my tweet. Well, Atwood retweeted me, you know, and it was one of my, the milestones in my Twitter journey. I thought, wow, I finally made it. Margaret Atwood has retweeted me. So it's just about it. sort of being it. tapped into those things as well and, and giving it a shot. The other thing is video and photos. You know, there's nothing like an image or a video to get people interested. And if your tweets and your social media isn't using those these days, then you won't get action. 
when something happens in my writing, but we had a, outside my work, we had a big, um, a road that had been torn apart and there was people getting splashed and they had nowhere to go. And I took video of that and, and, and tweeted it at my local counselor. Well, there was action taken. So that nothing sh shows the story like a good picture. Um, and the last point is, it's back to the sort of the chat question and some of the functions, different platforms for different things. Don't compose a tweet and then share the exact same words on Facebook and the exact same words on Instagram. Every platform is used differently. And you need to know that because it doesn't, you know, people will see it if it's, if you're, if you're just sort of sharing the same message across all of them. So be this, thoughtful. Yeah. And, and, and it's okay to make it personal, right? So there, there's a question actually in the chat box, Danny, I'm just mindful of time and I just wanted yep. to get to one. Sure. Um, Sheila was asking, because you were talking about the power of video, is a highly produced video or something just more organic? Does it make a difference? Um, yeah. Don't waste your time for doing a highly produced yeah. video. You won't see the reward from that. I mean, now look at us all on this Zoom call. You know, look at us doing a Facebook Live. I mean, at Action Against Hunger, we started three years ago, live Fridays. Every Friday, we just film something in our office and we do it live. And I mess up all the time and it's just natural. And that's how it goes. And that's an authentic voice. Uh, so no, I think that's the way to go. Uh, and yeah, remember that with advocacy too, you don't be one trick ponies, whereas every single thing you tweet is about your organization and your cause. It gets a bit tired. Have some diversity, you know, if you're into the World Cup, tweet about that. If you're into Drake, tweet about that once in a while. You know, we're, we're, we're made up of many different elements as humans and your social media profile should, should show that. We, uh, we call like hooking to a, a local story. You can take something global, even the Drake example, when he showed his mansion, you know, it got a lot of heat, but it would be an entry point and an opportunity to kind of bring the story back to the global. Maybe just one last question, and I'm, I'm afraid it's a big one, but I know it's something that you care very passionately about, Danny, so I'm going to include it. Can you, uh, the question from Robin, but also second by Johanna is, can you speak a little bit, uh, and again, we only have a minute or two, but to the ethics of development reporting? Oh gosh, a minute or I two. <laughs> um, you know, there, this has evolved so much as well. It's also kind of that thing that's in constant flux. You know, honestly, the flies and the sick babies, they were, yeah. they were used for so long in our sector because they work. And we are underfunded and we're saving lives. So we have this constant battle where we say, well, we need to do the work in Northeast Nigeria. This is the situation. So we seem to have come away from that. And I, and I do support that at the end of the day, as long as we're finding other creative ways to raise money. Um, and so the ethics are always changing and it's tricky because I come from a journalism background. Uh, yeah. So my ethics were always a bit more like, get the story, you need to tell the story, that's how you help people. Um, but you know, when you're also the face of an international organization, you have to be cognizant of the fact that those are the communities you work in and you need to have respect for them and, and their dignity and you know, you need to make sure that you're treating them the way you'd want to be treated when somebody's in your community. And nothing underscores that like this current crisis, so. Danny, I, you know, I can say knowing you personally and also working with you that you're definitely a person that lives by a moral code that is upstanding and also the work that you do is fabulous. Um, so we've put, uh, follow Danny on, on Twitter, but also look to his organization. Um, uh, we'll send some information out after the call with some more information about the website. You do amazing work. Um, so at Action Against Hunger. So thank you very much, Danny, and My uh, thank you thank to you. the great questions in the chat box. Thanks. Take care. We're back to Good you. Good luck. Lisa. Thank Bye. you. Danny, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your, your wisdom and Chris for moderating. That was really fascinating to listen to. Um, great. Uh, so uh, the perspective on digital media engagement is is um, is so interesting, and and we understand it a little bit more now thanks thanks to that discussion, uh, in particular uh, with journalists and how to amplify messages and what works and what doesn't work. Um, I think the the other perspective now that I think will be interesting to hear about is. Um, really using online for political engagement with parliamentarians. So that's the next kind of deep dive that I'd like to do. Uh, so as you know, there, there are many ways to take action and to influence decision makers. So 
for example, uh, from the homepage of Results Canada uh, website, you have actions that you can take for um, our current campaign. So you can um, write letters to the editor, uh, op-ed to have meetings with your MP, and um, use pre-prepared tweets and posts that you can instantly share on your social media channels. But with the power of digital that we're learning today, we have another dimension that we can take advantage of to amplify our advocacy. So for example, you can take that letter to the editor, that LTE or op-ed that you've written and take a screenshot of it or share the link if it's been published and send it to your MP by tagging them and others that you feel are important. You can, um, when you were having meetings with your MP and if you, uh, virtual meetings with MPs have started now, uh, you can take a screenshot and share it on social media and tag your MP or uh, tweet directly at your MP. Let your MP know about the issues that matter to you by tweeting directly at them. It really works. Um, and, and through all of this, let's not forget the positive messages because while it's good to hold decision makers accountable, it's also important to highlight on social media the positive work being done. And openparliament.ca is a website where you can see what your MP has been up to. So when they've made speeches in house debates or made statements. And for most MPs, you can be redirected from this website directly to their social media pages. So it's a, it's a good resource to know what your MP has been up to that you can then take and, uh, and get specific with your message to them. So before we get into the strategy of political engagement online, let's make sure we're all on the same page here with the lingo. You know, so we've explained social media um, is, um, is uh, platforms uh, like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, we're talking more specifically about Twitter today, but as Danny mentioned, you have to do your research and know where your MP is active and what accounts they have. So that openparliament.ca is a good resource for you to learn about that. Now in the yellow here is our top 10 list of social media tips and you'll receive this as a separate worksheet in your webinar package along with some other stuff. So you'll be able to go home with this. But I've highlighted a few words in here to make sure that they're understood. So thank you in advance to our social media expert participants on this webinar today for this educational moment. Um, so as I just kind of mentioned in our number two uh, tip, pick your platform, do your research, know what platform your decision maker is uh, following and paying attention to. And by platform, we mean any of these social media vehicles, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, use the right hashtags, tip number eight. So a hashtag or the pound sign, these are used for a keyword or a phrase and it helps to show up in a search. So you would use a hashtag for a movement or an event. So for example, the hashtag me too. And number nine, tag the right people. So the at symbol or tag represents someone's handle or what I like to think of it as it's like an address. So you can tag an individual business or any entity by using their handle. So this notifies the recipient and hyperlinks to their profile. So you would use a tag for a person or a group. So if you wanted to send a message to Justin Trudeau, you would use his handle or the at symbol Justin Trudeau. So it's no secret that letters to the editor op-eds and meetings with MP as we've been discussing are considered some of the best and most effective advocacy tools for political engagement. But let's just look at these stats, particularly on Twitter. It's very heavily used by parliamentarians. Of the 338 members of parliament, there are roughly, and the numbers vary depending on what source uh, you'll consult, there are roughly about 313 active users. So that's about 80%. And in fact, the hashtag Canadian Poly, which stands for Canadian politics, was the most mentioned hashtag in 2019. So that means that it's monitored and used widely within the Canadian political arena. And I know Results Canada uh, uses it when we want a minister or a decision maker to see our tweets. Now, it's no surprise that Justin Trudeau was the most mentioned Canadian politician on Twitter in 2019, followed by Andrew Scheer and Doug Ford. 
and the tweet that you see here on your screen, this had over 111,000 likes, and it's when Justin Trudeau used Twitter to announce Canada's commitment of 50 million Canadian dollars to the Education Cannot Wait Fund supporting women and girls education. So quite incredible that he used the Twitter platform to make this important and significant announcement. So when engaging in online advocacy, you wanna be strategic. You have to know what you're trying to achieve. And as Danny mentioned, uh, you have to know who you want your message directed to. And you have to know what you're asking for. So in other words, what action do you want this person that you're tagging to take? Do you want them to speak to someone? Do you want them to write a letter? Do you want them to make a statement in the house? And as you may have heard MP Heather McPherson say at last week's webinar, you have to have a very specific ask. So once you have your ask, you need to research, is it a party leader or a minister that would be in the best position to receive your communication to be able to action it? And what hashtag will you use to support your ask to get more attention? So here to shed some light on best practice for digital political engagement is our own Lindsay Sheridan, who is the parliamentary officer at Results Canada. Lindsay engages on a regular basis with members of parliament and senators on important global health issues and creates an ongoing platform for advocacy, awareness and action. Prior to this, Lindsay was a staffer on Parliament Hill for MP Cheryl Hardcastle of Windsor Tecumseh. And during her time on the Hill, Lindsay worked exclusively on the human rights file, attending subcommittee meetings and supporting her MP in the critic role for human rights. So thank you for joining us today, Lindsay, and I'll manage your slides for you. You just tell me when and we'll pass it over to you. Okay, so hello everybody again and thanks Lisa for the introduction. I also wanted to just start off by saying that especially within COVID-19 now we're going to see the world moving towards virtual platforms and we're going to probably start to see an uptick in people engaging on these platforms because it is one of the best ways to communicate and it does seem to be growing in accessibility although there still is some issues to sort out. So I just wanted to say that this is something that is going to continue and to continue to grow so it's really fits and is relevant for the conversation right now to be discussing this. So uh, as Lisa mentioned, I'm going to quickly go over some of the things I think are important and also kind of explain from a parliamentary perspective what the pros and cons of using social media are. And like what was mentioned before, there's various, uh, I guess, on a spectrum of what MPs use social media for. If they're even on social media, I had one staffer straight up tell me that he wasn't going to use Twitter with his MP. So there is still kind of a spectrum on where they're advocating on. And it, it's really important what Danny had mentioned earlier that you need to find the platform that they're most comfortable with. And so if that maybe that is their community Facebook group, maybe they are holding a town hall. So you want to kind of do your research and find out which account is going to be the best to engage on. And if you're comfortable engaging on there, even for issues that are community related, as Danny mentioned. So sorry, Lisa, could you go to my next slide? Yes, I just wanted to see you for a second. So um, do you see the screen now? Yep. Great. So. Perfect. So I just wanted to start off and say that this with this quote, and this is from the inter uh, the International Parliamentary Union. And so parliamentarians are starting to notice this more. So you cannot wait for the people to come to Parliament, you need to go to where the people are today, the people are on social media, and increasingly parliaments are there too. So you're starting to see an uptick in people realizing the value of social media, not only with their constituents, but also sending out their messaging. So first, I just wanted to talk about news and online activity because I think it's something really important. As a staffer, one of the first things that my member's assistant told me when talking about news and trying to find out where my MP was finding her news, she, she moved me over towards, at the bottom, um, an aggregate website called National News Watch. And I was told that most of the MPs use this source specifically to find out their news really quickly because it's really all related to federal politics. There's also a climate corner and an international spot and a think tank spot. So it's a good place just to kind of, if you want to catch up on what's going on in federal politics and see what other MPs are kind of looking towards, I would suggest trying National News Watch. And it's just an aggregate. So it'll take you to other uh, news sources like the Star and such like that. Another thing I wanted to point out that a lot of people don't realize is that your parliamentarian usually will do what is called a householder. So 
uh, pretty much once a quarter, so four times a year, they will actually send out in their community and you can uh, kind of apply online or uh, like sign up for the newsletter. And in this newsletter or householder, which they call them, they'll kind of give you what they think is important news in their community. So it's a good way to kind of zone in on what the MPs are doing and what they're passionate about. So here I just have a really small clip from an MP. And so this is part of their householder. And so, yeah, it just really points to things happening in the community, what other things they're focusing on, some of the impacts they've made. And so it's a good place to kind of check out what your MP is focusing on in the news. Another great way to kind of see is that MPs usually primarily also find a lot of their news from their local newspapers. And so it's a good way to kind of keep up is just checking in. So like going on the Ottawa Citizen and seeing what's going on in the community and checking through those forums. Uh, finally, on this slide, here we have Heather McPherson's Twitter, which was used last, which she was with us last week. And I just wanted to point out, it's interesting because you have some MPs who use their Twitter account, they're the ones putting it out. And so you can kind of judge their social media to kind of get that understanding, or they'll put it in their kind of tagline at the start, like opinions are my own. But I think it's interesting because here, Heather is talking about dogs, which is always a great thing to talk about. And something like Danny was saying, it kind of breaks up and shows that she is personable and she's engaged. So you always want to kind of check out their social media to see, yeah, does it look like a staffer is operating the account? Because oftentimes that does happen. But increasingly, MPs are taking over control because they do want to monitor more at a high level what's going on in their kind of Twitter space or in their social media space. And funny enough, I think a lot of MPs are starting to tackle Instagram more and more because there is a large youth population in the base. So it is a really important place to target. So also check out Instagram if you're curious. And I have been seeing some things and staffers have been asking me whether or not they should start engaging on TikTok. So that's another new avenue. So something to keep an eye on, but again, another form of media. So Lisa, you can go to the next slide. And so, uh, this, this information is actually taken from the European Parliamentary Forum and they held a kind of, I guess, a webinar, I guess you could say, on messaging and media for parliamentarians in Kigali. So this information is what parliamentarians were told were the pros and cons of using social media. And I think it's important to kind of understand because you can use these tips as well. And if you are new to the social media space, it's important to kind of think through these things because there are a lot of uh, different variables that come to play and there are a lot of things that can make you more or less effective. And so this is from the parliamentarian perspective, but it's something important for you to understand as well. So social media can create a space for dialogue. Obviously it can put you in touch with people that you might not always have access to or who are in different areas of your community. It also brings you or your MP closer to the public. So if you are very active on your Facebook group or you are super involved in your senior MP there, you can comment real time and kind of build a relationship online. It also helps build credibility and trust. So if your MP is there and engaged, you know, you kind of trust that they're monitoring the accounts, that they care about issues. It supports greater transparency because you're able to have a conversation with them and kind of have an understanding. Now, offering opportunities for third party syndication and support. So that's interesting because you can have unusual suspects coming in and supporting you. So you might have like, like what Danny was saying, Margaret Atwood popped in and so she was very effective in helping communicate. So you do never know when you can have unusual suspects and people who will help get your messaging and support you. So it's another interesting way. Obviously, there is space for viral distribution. That, that can be a pro and a con, which I can mention, because if something goes viral and it's positive, it can be really great. But if you go viral towards something negative, it's not necessarily what you want to show to the world. It is very cost effective if you do have a cell phone, which increasingly more people around the world are having access to cell phones, which is really fantastic. Obviously, there's still a lot of areas where that can be improved upon. And then a better understanding of public opinion in real time monitoring. You can, MPs can go out and see what people are talking about and they can kind of have an understanding of what their communities are, opinions are and what their beliefs are, even if it is something as, as simple as there's a lot of raccoons in the city. So it is something important and it is really kind of a touch point for a lot of people because vastly many people are joining social media now. So there are, there is a large presence. Uh, and then if you want to release something fast, it's great, which is also for advocacy, right? Timely, relevant is really important. 
And then it can become a really core part of your comms strategy. And so not only does this work at the individual level or the parliamentarian level, but as an organization as well. So you can create a hub for engagement and dissemination. And so although this is like the parliamentarian perspective, I think it's important to think of it from your own viewpoint, as well as when you're understanding how to engage with your parliamentarian, you should also kind of think through these as well. So Lisa, we can go on to the next slide. Okay, so now some of the cons. And so the cons are important from uh, your perspective and when we're engaging in social media as well, because you wanna make sure that you're not kind of creating an environment that maybe trolls will come or you're not spreading misinformation or creating dialogue around something that's necessarily negative. And so when MPs or parliamentarians are thinking about the cons of social media, there is different etiquette and there are different protocols across all the platforms. So writing an op-ed, which I would still consider media, that is very information heavy. It's very laden with language versus being on Twitter, you're, you have less characters. You have to make it really quick, snappy, and exciting. And so there are all different protocols. So it can be hard to navigate and it can be kind of difficult to ensure that you're on the same page. Obviously for everybody, not just parliamentarians, we are seeing increased reputational risks at play. So just making sure that messaging is like always thinking about your messaging beforehand, making sure it's timely and relevant and making sure as we had in one of our discussions that someone's not gonna be able to dig something up and make it an issue. So you also need to have your um, messaging perceived as relevant to the audience. And this is something I found really interesting from the parliamentarian perspective is some parliamentarians might have very exciting causes in their own mind, but they might not be relevant to the communities they work in. So the same thing applies. You wanna make sure that it's relevant and that the audience is gonna care about it. And then you also wanna carefully tailor your content. So you wanna make sure you're hitting all the important messaging points. You wanna make sure you're making it relevant. You wanna make sure it fits the platform you're using. There's also potential to move rapidly and beyond your control. So you might say something on Twitter that just blows up. So you wanna make sure that you're able to monitor it while also staying informed and ensuring that you are part of a conversation. And then finally, uh, recruitment is hard and there's no guarantee of productive dialogue. So kind of what this means is you don't know who's gonna interact with your different content and you can't guarantee that maybe that productive dialogue will come from it. Maybe somebody has a different opinion and so they bring something up that not necessarily is productive to what you were talking about. So I thought that this was kind of a good way to just understand not only from the parliamentarian perspective what they're thinking about, but also these apply to you when you're thinking about how you're curating content across your platforms. And it is just some tips to help make sure that you are thinking through some of these questions. But also, I think social media is a place for fun too. It's not as serious, it can be informal. And so it is a place to share funny gifts or memes. And so I think that you do need to have some of your personality involved because like Danny was saying, we are all human and we do have interests that go beyond um, what we advocate for. All, so it, it does help you kind of humanize you. So just some tips that I would say for engaging with parliamentarians online. If you're new to Twitter or you wanna engage, one of the things I always like to say is to ask them a very relevant and pointed question on something specific. So you can tag your MP and ask a question and hopefully that will garner a response and it also signal to your MP that you care about this topic. So that's a great way to get started. And like Lisa was saying, you can share the hashtag and maybe make it bigger, add a minister to it and hopefully try to drum up a conversation. You can also kind of have a different strategy and try to just amplify certain messaging so that it comes to the eyes of the people and the decision makers. So building the movement is really important and then supporting tweets that also matter. And so I think my time is running up. I will hand it back to Lisa and I think we're gonna have some questions now. Yeah, we definitely have time uh, for questions. So uh, put your questions in the in the chat box, or uh, I'll stop I'll stop share for a second, and you can unmute yourself and ask Lindsay your question directly. Uh, I, I'll start Lindsay with a question: Is there is there too much engagement with your MP? Like, how do you how do you know kind of what that threshold is in terms of am I starting to bug them too much or am I starting to not be a friendly face because I'm I'm doing too much what would kind of be the rule of thumb if I'm new to doing this and and just understanding how much I can and should engage 
So I think it's important to remember that advocacy is relationship building at the end of the day. And so even when you're engaging with your MPs, you want to make sure to build that relationship. And I think this question comes up often is how many times should you check in, what you should be checking in on. And so largely, I think it has to do with um, how you feel your relationship is with your MP, but also without being, I don't like, it's a harsh word, but annoying. So I usually say one, once a month is a really high threshold to be checking in, but also if you see something that's relevant and timely, that's really what's going to be most impactful. You don't want to check in um, if you don't really have anything really substantial, but you can check in in like soft kind of ways, like liking different posts or retweeting, like that could be a way to signal to your MP that you're still engaged while also not being um, asking them questions all the time or sending them emails constantly. So there are other ways you can do that, even attending virtual town halls. A lot of MPs now are trying to set up virtual town hall meetings. So just making your presence known there is also really important. So there are small ways to get involved and to make your presence known, while also not being annoying. Thank you for that. Um, just waiting for more questions. I, I have a ton, so I'll just keep asking until I see someone's hand or unmuted or, or questions in the chat box. We haven't really talked about engagement uh, advocacy um, with senators. So uh, can you talk a little bit uh, about that? Yeah, I think senators are kind of like, they're exciting and they're also kind of, they're, they're also hard to engage with in a certain way because they are really important to the Canadian system and they can, they do have a different presence online. So I think when we come down to MPs, a lot of them are staying within their party, which is fine and using messaging related to their parties. When we're talking about mess, uh, senators, if you just look through some various senators' Twitters, they're advocating and retweeting and supporting all kinds of different content that is probably different from what MPs will be posting because they're not as confined to their parties as much anymore and that, that the Senate is evolving in these various roles. So I think senator engagement is also important because there are many different ways you can engage, whether it's doing a Twitter conversation or even trying to uh, team up with a senator to write an op-ed, which is a piece of, which is a piece and can be digital advocacy as well. So writing an op-ed with a senator could be something that could be useful. And it's also just senators are, I find to be, they have really good friendships within the Senate and they're all, I would say, closer than a lot of MPs. Not to say that MPs don't have friends, but I think the senators also are really good at talking with one another and then also engaging so you can build more people in a certain extent. I saw, was it Yousef that raised um, a hand? The, the message went by very quickly, but if you did, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Oh, it was an error. Okay, we forgive you. That's okay. Um, there's a question from Tara from Farm Radio. The question is, a lot of people I work with are afraid of being too pushy with opinions that might turn MPs off or jeopardize future funding by pushing too hard or having an opinion that is disagreed with. How do you balance that but stay true to your organization's goals? I think there are always moments to make your voice known and to be like very present and maybe opposed to something. But I also think that there are moments where maybe being more respectful and humble are, are also really important. And so I think it is becoming increasingly a bigger question that I think not only civil society, but we have to talk about because there are things that MPs say that we firmly disagree with, but you also, like you said, don't want to tarnish that relationship. So it's like, how can you create a dialogue instead of maybe just saying like, that's wrong or your opinion doesn't make sense. Like, how can you instead have a dialogue within that? So maybe your MP is tweeting something that necessarily you don't agree with. Like, can you start a conversation? Can you ask some questions? Can you open up a space to do advocacy within that? But that's not to say that there are moments where it might be most strategic for your organization who has firm beliefs in something to come out and just disagree. And I think that it's, it's kind of a fine line to walk on because there can be implications. So I think you need to really play it um, close to your heart as well in some place, but also be strategic. So if there is room for further dialogue and to have a conversation and explain more about why maybe that MP feels that way, then you can maybe get to common ground and have a better understanding. But if it is something that's very strong, I think it's also important as a sector that we are have pushing back. It is our role and it is our position to do so. And so we have to make sure that it's timely though, and that it's gonna be the right move. 
So I hope that's helpful, but it is a tricky, it is a tricky thing. And maybe Chris or Taryn can speak more about that. I know that they've had lots of experience. Well, thank you for that. Um, Hello? I see more questions coming in, but we have to move on. So perhaps um, we, we can answer them within the chat box. And if we have some time at the end of the webinar, we can get to it later. But thank you, Lindsay, so much for spending the time with us and sharing your insight and um, inside information about MPs and senators. I really appreciate it very much. Thank you. Um, we're going to do our breakout activity now. Uh, so you're going to go back into the groups that you had uh, at the start of the webinar and do a group assignment. So together, uh, what I'd like to ask you to do is draft at least one tweet using tags. So we've talked about what tags are. You want to pick your decision makers and make sure that you're tagging them in your tweet and include relevant hashtags. So the topic that I'd like you to create a tweet about is this. Let Canadian decision makers know that you want to see greater Canadian leadership in the global COVID-19 response, one that ensures we stay on track to meet the SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals. So you'll have a group leader with you who will have a cheat sheet of tags and hashtags that you can use to help you through this if you need it. And uh, just want to remind you of Twitter best practice. So three top tips, keep it short. The character count on Twitter is 280 characters and that includes links, hashtags and tags. Use the right hashtags uh, because this will help people discover your content and make it easier for people to like and retweet and share. Uh, when you use the hashtag Canada for results that specifically allows results Canada to see your tweets and helps to amplify your message. So always try and use that in your uh, social media and OCIC's hashtag that you can use is uh, Global Solidarity Matters. Tagging people is critical. This will notify the right people and will increase the chance of your posts being seen and shared by them. So I've put here an example of what a tweet needs to look like. You'll see the various hashtags. You'll see the tags uh, directing at uh, the people or the organizations that you want to have see this message. And there is uh, a very specific ask. I want to see Canada make bold investments in GPI and Gabby and the reasons why. So all of those components need to be a part of your tweet. And so I will ask Ohenia to put you back in your groups so that you can create your group tweet now. So good luck and we'll see you at the end of the activity. Uh, before I let you go, I wanted to uh, let you know that again, this is the fourth installment and there's still one more exciting webinar to come, which is going to happen on May 28th, and it's entitled Tracking Progress, Best Practices in Monitoring and Evaluating Advocacy. So if you haven't registered yet, please do so. And a reminder that you'll have top tips and hashtag suggestions and tag suggestions all as part of this webinar package that you will be able to use as resources after the session. And if Taryn is there, if you wouldn't mind just letting the group know about next steps in the series wrap up. Sure. Um, so yeah, so next week is our final uh, webinar. So we're going to focus on a big question, which is, okay, great. You know how to do advocacy. You've done your actions, but then how do you actually tell if you're having impact? So how do you monitor and evaluate if you're doing some good advocacy and what the outcomes are? So hope you can all make it, but we're also going to spend some time uh, next week doing a wrap up of the series. So we'll do kind of a reflection on some of the things we've learned. We're going to share with you guys some resources and some opportunities to stay engaged um, in advocacy going forward. So we really hope that you can make it. Um, and if you haven't registered yet, do so. We're also going to be sending out a survey. And if you complete that survey about the um, workshop, then we'll send you a certificate too to show that you've accomplished the advocacy boot camp. So hope you can all make it. Great. Awesome. And I want to say I'm seeing people copy their links from their Twitter account into the chat. Melissa, Frank, Chris, our Twitter queen, awesome. You can click on those and you can go to some of our participants' Twitter page to see that they have indeed sent out their tweet. So 
thank you and encouraging everybody else to, to do the same. So of course, uh, like I said, you'll have the webinar recording from the session and you'll have the workbook with all of the top tips, et cetera. If you haven't seen Results Canada's new website yet and you're new to advocacy, we do provide step-by-step -step instructions for all of our actions so you can learn how to take a particular action to make your voice heard on the topics or issues that you care most about. And the Your Tools section is also a great resource for education and action tools. So on behalf of Results Canada and OCIC, thank you so much for attending. Wishing you a great day. Please stay safe and stay healthy. And thanks for joining us.